I'm Khalil E. Colonna, and this is Nashville. In 2000, the Nashville Conflict Resolution Center was founded to help residents of Davidson County who could not afford attorneys settle their case outside of a courtroom. Through mediation, the NCRC helps people resolve disputes quickly, safely, and effectively without having to go before a judge. Mediation can look like helping parents establish parenting agreements, working with people involved in a victim-offender dynamic such as harassment, bullying, or vandalism come to a solution, or providing a path to resolution for disputes like those between landlords and tenants. During COVID, the organization started to provide remote mediation, which has allowed it to help Tennesseans all across the state. Sarah Fiegel has been involved with the NCRC for over 12 years, including eight years as the executive director. She retired earlier this year, but still volunteers with the organization. So we're super grateful to have Sarah here with us today. Sarah, welcome to This is Nashville. Thanks for having me. Really, thank you for being here. Okay, so you've retired. You got time on your hands to think about stuff. When you woke up today, what was the big thought on your mind? Well, I look out the window I think, hmm, what a lovely day. (laughs) (laughs) And I take stock of the fact that I no longer feel like I have 4,000 problems I need to solve before noon. Mm. I am very grateful for that. And still, retirement is still new enough that I am aware of letting go of that hypervigilance. Okay. And it's beautiful. And then I think, hmm, do I want to weave first or maybe practice some music on the music stand. Mm-hmm. Hypervigilance yeah. is an interesting word, interesting term, interesting motif we have here in our country and our society. A lot is to be given for work ethic, and I appreciate that. But I feel like hypervigilance leads to neurosis, leads to anxiety, leads to a whole host of unhealthy things that we willingly put into our bags because we want to get things done because of I, there's some sort of mantle uh, a badge of honor that we have when you're saying you're being hyper vigilant, taking care of all these things. How do you think about that now that you've had time to separate yourself from working to, you know, live your life and to think about stuff? How do you put hyper vigilance work ethic into its proper place? That's a really important question. Because it is, I think, a particularly American thing to valorize overwork, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's kind of a cliche, right? It's the Americans who, you know, you, if someone says, how are you doing? You're never supposed to say, ah, you know, footloose and fancy free, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. We say, oh, man, I'm so busy. I've got so much going on. I've uh-huh. right? So we, we prove our value that we are contributors, that we're part of the whole because we're really busy and working hard on stuff. But I think, though, yeah, I mean, and, and I, too, I deeply believe in a work ethic. I think it's very important. Well, the irony is, you know, we have, we have this idea that everybody has to be super busy, but also that things should kind of be easy yeah. and safe. Uh-huh. And, you know, oh, if you bother me, it's your problem, not mine, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think of a work ethic as being willing to dig in and be uncomfortable and get stuff done. And the hypervigilance is when it tips over into feeling responsible for more things than are reasonable, probably. Mm. I don't know. Um, You know, it's considered also a trauma response for people who have had a lot of uncertainty in life. One response is to constantly be on alert and ready to meet any challenge. This can become a superpower, but it's also draining. Yeah. Yeah. And for the past, I say... Eight, ten to eight years, we've talked a lot about, in society, we've talked a lot about self-care yeah. and the need for that. I, I feel like it's because we've been overly hypervigilant yeah. and, and losing that part of ourselves. Mm-hmm. All right, so you've been working most recently in mediation, and uh, you retired from the NCRC. Let's get to the basics. What is mediation? Like, what exactly is it? It's just, oh, I love it so much. Mediation is... An open and empathetic conversation between two people that involves someone helping them connect. Mm. That's why it's not just a conversation. It's a mediation because you have a mediator, literally someone in the middle, helping two people, like almost decoding, right? Mm -hmm. Or translating 
between people who are struggling with something. And they're struggling usually so much that they just have a lot of noise in their heads around their own problems. They don't really hear each other anymore, or they might see the other as the problem. And a mediator helps bring people in a high-pitched problem to slow down, de-escalate, bring down the fight or flight, Mm -hmm. and start to hear each other and understand each other as another human also with problems. Is is there a particular uh, character trait or genetic imprint for a good mediator? I think a good mediator is going to be someone who is very curious about people and so is always wondering like, okay, I'll have my first impression of you and then what, and then what, and then what, Mm -hmm. and then what. So there has to be a curiosity beyond impressions or biases. Yeah. And of course there has to be compassion. I mean, I I always say mediators are supposed to be neutral parties to a, a, a discussion, but neutral does not mean uncaring. Neutral means extravagant, unconditional love for everyone in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. You know? And it's, it's perfectly legitimate to say that because a mediator isn't a judge. Mm. So if I'm a mediator, I walk into a room, I am going to believe in everybody's best self. And it's not my problem if they're not there every day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not either. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and I also think a mediator needs to... Again, be curious enough to avoid needing to be an advocate. Ah. And, you know, we get a lot of people who say, I care deeply about issue A, B, C, or D, all of which are incredibly important, right? But they care so much about a particular issue or set of issues that they're not able to be neutral if that issue's on the table. Mm -hmm. So they're not good mediators. They're needed by society as advocates, But advocates aren't good mediators. Do mediators have to have patience? Oh, yes. And I think a good mediator, well, good mediators evolve. I mean, good mediators learn over decades. Mm -hmm. They just do. It's communication, and we're always learning to communicate better every single day we live, right? But I think mediators have to be able to hold conflict in a room to sit with people who might get really upset and understand that there are many different conflict styles. So one person's style might be to be a turtle or crawl under a rock. Mm -hmm. Someone else's style might be to be very loud and aggressive. They're both in conflict, right? And so learning to kind of read signals and understand how different people respond to conflict in the same room while you're there and help each of them emerge from that fight or flight in whatever style they use kind of back to a spot where they can have vented and then can start talking with instead of shouting at. Okay. Okay. I'm a middle child and I always felt like I'm uh, born mediator, kind of just through birth order, you know, yeah, uh, working yeah. that out. And it's, it. so, so does you, it resonate what I'm saying? Yes, it totally does. It really does. It's, it allows, I've, I've been often in situations, not just with si- siblings, but friends in high school, college, even in my adult life. Hey, we're having this issue. Khalil, be the diplomat, if you will, bring yeah. people to, to each other side to understand each other. And you have to have a little bit of an ability to, not just see people's perspectives, but to see the multiple paths forward where everybody's moving together in concert? That can be dangerous, though. Okay. I mean, I think that to see, to hear subtext in people, to be able to read people's body language and realize they may be saying X, Y, Z, but they're actually signaling that they maybe feel differently about it. You know, it's it's peeling the onion, helping mm-hmm. people peel away layers until they can be honest. But at the end of the day, if people are willing to be, if the people feel safe enough to be kind of raw and honest about where they are in a problem together, they are going to have a sense of where to go. Okay. And it's, it's more a question of just making the context appropriate for them to say, you know, how about this? Because my normal's my normal. I have to check it at the door. I don't know what's going to be good for 
any of the people I work with better than they do. Mm. I can help them reality test the things that they suggest. But at the end of the day, I also have to deeply respect that they are going to come up with a solution that fits into their lives that may be a tiny help, it may be a huge help, it may be transformative. It's just making possible their connection mm. so they can come up with it. Is that what you would tell someone who, like, who's about to enter into mediation as far as uh, having someone mediate a conf- come to mediate a conflict that they're experiencing? Like, mm-hmm. like, is that the thing that helps mediation work? It's like, hey, change your thinking. Yes, advocate for yourself. Have everything you need on your side to get through your point. And be but willing to listen also. Be willing to listen. And I think, you know, sometimes it's very hard Why well, in a marriage, right? There are times when my husband and I may feel differently about something and it's very, we've, we've talked about it. We've tried to talk about it. We're both good communicators, but by golly, uh-uh, not happening, right? And it becomes this neurotic loop. Hmm. But if we're out to dinner with someone and suddenly I kind of allude to it to my friend sitting next to me and then Gerald responds to the friend sitting next to me and we kind of reopen the conversation through each of us talking to our friend. Mm -hmm. Each of us can afford to hear each other differently. I don't have to see him talking at me and get ready to respond. I see him talking to my friend and I think, oh, oh, that's mediation, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? It's not a trained mediation. It's not, but, but that is, it's so human that need. Sometimes. If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Khalil Ekelona. We're talking this hour about mediation, life, art, and pursuing the road left traveled with Sarah Fiegel, who recently retired as the executive director of the Nashville Conflict Resolution Center. So I wanted to ask you about that because you mentioned, you know, uh, you just painted us a picture of a potential conflict of communication you're having with your husband and how you can find mediation through that friend. But those are two people who know each other intimately, probably the most intimately of, of anyone on the planet. What's it like when they're strangers or don't know each other well? Something like a landlord tenant situation. How do you? Well, then they're coming in, right? Then we have two people coming in with a whole lot of preconceptions, right? You and I might be coming into a table and I just know you as that landlord who is trying to evict me even though I think I did everything right and you just know me as the tenant who won't pick up the phone and who hasn't you know who's been late with rent and those are just categories and you know we're not going to feel empathetic about a category Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. so again if we can actually mediate in the same room at a table and if you and I just try to talk this over, we're probably going to both get defensive and aggressive pretty fast, yeah. right? In today's society, yes. Especially. But a mediator might start by saying, so tell me a little bit about what's going on, right? So, you know, what got you here? And we'll just start asking open-ended questions to help the landlord express the frustration that maybe the landlord has undergone and uh, a feeling of helplessness about what else to do other than go to the court. And a tenant might, again, wouldn't be able to talk to the landlord at this point, but might say to the mediator, well, you know, the problem is I had to leave town because my mother was really sick and my dad was, you know, deployed. And so I, ha- I was out of town. And by the time I got back and that, you know, there might be a story where the landlord says, oh, sheesh, I remember when I took care of my mom. Um, I know yeah. it's rough. And... I would just wish you'd picked up the phone and the landlord, the tenant might say, I know, I just, I felt so embarrassed because I've never been in this situation in my whole life. And I was just, you know, honestly, I just was ashamed. I just didn't want to deal until I could get all the money together. And, you know, communication broke down. But now there, there are two people who are seeing, okay, there was a hiccup and communication broke down, but sheesh, we can put that back together, Mm -hmm. right? You know, you were with the organization NCRC for 12 years, over 12 years, mm-hmm. and you've facilitated a lot of mediations. How did you evolve as a mediator yourself when you first got in there to where you are now? Or, And let me ask, is this something that you kind of naturally had from growing up the way you did? Um, I first went to mediator training because 
a colleague of mine from a former life said, you're really good at this stuff. Why don't, let's go do this. So I probably was able to hear what's really going on when people talk, right? I can hear multiple layers. I, I find people fascinating, right? So maybe there's, maybe I'm, I am part of that larger group of people who are inclined to do it. But that doesn't mean I didn't have to have a lot of very humbling experiences over the last 12 years, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And one thing that, you know, when we train mediators, we encourage them to, in fact, require them to co-mediate a lot. I'd always just as soon have a co-mediator in a room with me. But, you know, I, I assure people that, you know, we all have our own styles. I have co-mediated so many times with people who drove me crazy the way they mediated, but they were the ones who asked the right question, not me, right? Mm -hmm. So it's always humbling to realize that I may be good at it, but it's, it's luck in a way. It's not that I'm the one with all the talent. I just happen to be someone who's good at helping people calm down and hear themselves honestly and hear other people. It's not that I'm not telling them anything. I'm making a space open for them. Okay. And learning that, again, it's like stepping away from thinking, oh, I'm going to go help these people. Yeah. No. <laughs> so you work to help Nashville's court system, particularly like the juvenile justice court, mm -hmm. to adopt more mediation services. Why was that so important and how did you do it? Well, mediation is actually a tool of the legal system. I mean, this is something funny, actually. And the history of mediation comes from two sides. It, it comes as a legal tool, but then also as a social justice tool from outside the legal system trying to resolve things without recourse, right, to something formal. And NCRC is a community mediation center, a nonprofit mediation center. There are others in Tennessee. They're all over the country. And they are kind of uniquely positioned between kind of the, the nonprofit world and the legal world. And we know that lower income, middle income people, a lot of people cannot afford the legal, to get really entangled in the legal system. They cannot afford attorneys. And when people go into a courtroom without an attorney, it's probably not going to go well for them. Mm -hmm. That's not what it was designed for, right? Mm -hmm. And it's through no fault of their own. And a judge, no matter how huge a heart he, she, they might have, um, a judge simply has to follow the law and cannot say, oh, your mother was dying? Well, let's work this out, right? Yeah. You can't. So, but mediation is called alternative dispute resolution by the legal system, and they are thrilled if we can get people out of the dockets to actually come up with solutions, because if people come up with their own solutions, they're also going to fulfill them. Mm -hmm. you know? We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll talk more with Sarah Fiegel about her personal story and the roads she's traveled. Stay with us. This is Nashville. Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. Welcome back. Welcome back. Today we are talking with Sarah Fiegel. She recently retired as the executive director of the Nashville Conflict Resolution Center. She's also had a few other adventures in her life and career. We're grateful to have her here to talk about her journey. Sarah, again, good to be with you. Okay, so you're born in rural northwestern North Dakota, grew up near Cincinnati. All right. So as a kid, I understand you wanted to be a Supreme Court justice and and a ballerina, not just a ballerina. I wanted to be a prima ballerina with the Bolshoi ballet. Wow. That's yeah. very specific. Oh, yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. What what <laughs> what did ballet? You, you, you practiced ballet, I imagine, when you were younger. Yeah, I, I, I was at the ballet school with the Cincinnati Ballet Company. What did it do for you as you were growing up? Oh, man. Up? Did you ever see Chorus Line? Yes. <laughs> like, everything was beautiful at the I ballet. saw the movie and, and I saw it on Broadway. It's so good. Um, no, but ballet really, I, I think truly it gave me an understanding of 
true discipline, it's one of the few arenas in which I'm actually willing to obey, right? Uh-huh. Ballet, it's, it's worth it. I learned that in order to be able to dance beautifully and extravagantly, you have to spend your whole life working on the simplest gesture. So the patience of developing art. Um, I think as a kid, you know, anything that is physical is necessary. You know, I, I, I don't think we even thought about it in those terms when I was a kid. I mean, I'm 59 now, so it was a long time ago. But we see children now who are very stationary. Mm-hmm. And it, it makes me sad for them. And I know that just constantly the discipline of moving my body and learning to express with it and to be embodied mm-hmm. was invaluable. Yeah, it adds to imagination. It adds to everything. Yeah. It's like what yeah. youth is supposed to be about, yeah. right? Not verbal, right? Yeah. Embodied. Yeah. You also shared that you didn't really like high school. You read a lot voraciously. And even if high school wasn't exactly for you, you ended up at Yale in the 80s. Yes. Definitely a different time in education, particularly Very. college. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what, what was what was your experience well, like as okay. a student? So my youngest child is about to be a senior in college. Uh-huh. And I have enjoyed or or railed against the differences. Because back when I was in college, um, it was just this wild intellectual adventure. I mean, I came from a very, you know, moderate income, middle class home, but with a lot of educational and cultural resources. My parents were professors, too, mm. the parents I grew up with most. But I got to Yale and, oh my goodness, there were just, it was ideas everywhere. There were just brilliant people taking brilliant chances and there was contention and argument and nothing safe about any minute of the day and the idea was this is where we get to argue and say i don't know and i don't like that and so why not and what should we do and Mm -hmm. you know I, i think i was really it helped probably solidify what i grew up being taught which is you know argument is not a personal attack it's it's a test. It's it's a way to exercise your thinking, and you know if we disagree, it's like cool. Can you bring it on? You know if you yeah. can make me change my mind, thank you. I'd rather be a better thinker, and I'm not per. You know, help me be a better thinker, or admit that you're wrong. <laughs> uh huh. You know. Uh huh. That that's 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 in short supply these days. All across our Which country. I don't get because it's really fun. Yeah. Well, people just feel existentially threatened by this stuff. And that's, I mean, we could spend days and days and days trying to get at that. Yeah. You, you, you talked about the, the intellectual challenging nature of the campus that you were in. It kind of reminds me of when I was in school. I used to tell my students when I taught high school yeah. that college for me, my, my, pe- my professors were intellectual sent from heaven. My friends were part of your sent from hell. I got the entire experience. Me too. All right. <laughs> well, okay. I was in college from 83 to 87, uh-huh. which was, I think that was the last gasping moment when drugs were still fun and not absolutely terrifying. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, as I was graduating, we were understanding the AIDS epidemic and I lost many college friends to it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, in the early days, we were in New Haven. We just drive to Manhattan and dance all night in some weird downtown place. And God only knows what all we got up to. Yeah. And then we'd go back and have these amazing seminars. <laughs> there, there's something about the, the adventure in that. Not yeah. saying that it, that's the path that everyone should take, but you're, you're, you're young adults exploring the world. And it seems like every step in that story, I feel like every step yeah. you're taking is a risk, a risk and a curious risk at it's, that. It's a cure. They're all curious risks. And Although, you know, obviously we can all debate where appropriate lines should be drawn. Um, they were considered risks. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, there were places I wouldn't go. There were things I wouldn't do. Mm-hmm. But, but the idea was to embrace life and take risks and figure, figure out what we don't know. Yeah. Find what you don't know, mm-hmm. not con- cement what you do. After college, yeah. you go to Los Angeles. <laughs> Right, because I was raised thinking I probably should go straight to graduate school and be a professor. And so I had to do the opposite of that. 
is that was was were you being rebellious or is that just your nature? Probably both. Okay. Well, and part of it, I think I was honestly kind of at total loose ends. I mean, I think my parents figured, okay, I went to Yale. I'd figure it out. I knew what I was doing. So I had absolutely no one was giving me any advice. And I'm graduating and kind of thinking, well, okay, so now what? And the default would be go to grad school and continue in the academic world I know. But that was not a risk. Hmm. That was not growing. That was not learning more. Um, Going off to Los Angeles to like live in someone's guest house and try and figure out how to make enough money to buy hummus, that was an interesting risk. And it's, a, it's an appropriate one at 21. Yeah. You know? What kind of work were you doing out there? Oh, well, I started reading scripts for, um, reading really bad scripts for a, a production company and writing up kind of analyses, doing script analyses. Okay. Because the person who ran that program figured if I had a literary degree from Yale, I probably could read a script. <laughs> so that helped, right? It really came in handy. Yeah. And I think, yeah. And then I got a really cool job. I can't even remember how I got this job. But it was a really cool job as an assistant film editor at the Roger Corman Film Studio in Venice Beach. And if you're not, I mean... Roger Corman's studio made was the epicenter of B movies, oh. like terrible movies shot on film, churned out, like fact, the Toxic Avenger and others. Oh, absolutely, uh-huh. absolutely. And I was working as you know an assistant assistant editor, learning it. Everything shot on thirty five millimeter, like literally cutting things with old movieola machines and taping film pits together. Fascinating education. I mean, I think everything, so much of my understanding of visual culture came from that period of time. Mm-hmm. Then I was writing and directing some theater pieces, because that's what I had also done in, in college. And I was really interested in experimental theater and in, in L.A. It was like, cool. Did you ever go to Al's Bar in L.A.? Doesn't matter. Remind me Detroit, where it is. Downtown. Oh, I I. I so I hung imagine out in some of the imagine abandoned down, parts of downtown where my friends would take over old abandoned warehouses and throw parties. And I danced at those parties, but ten years before you were there. So uh, ha ha. Okay. Um, but <laughs> but Al's bar's down there. I got gotcha. you. Anyway, so I was doing theater down there, kind of thing. And but anyway, so I was doing theater, but then I had to figure out how to pay the actors. So then I would just like temp for a while, and like get to know ho- other weird industries in L.A. Um, and then one night, talk about just like. Random things happen. A friend of mine who was, who is now a producer, a film producer, uh, we were supposed to have dinner, and he said, oh, shoot, you know, I totally forgot I have to go to a movie opening. Um, it's like Die Hard 2. Okay. And I was like, dude, let's just reschedule. You go to your movie. I'll, you know, and he's, no, 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 just come. It'll be really fun. So, and it was really fun, of course. It's a totally fun movie. But there I happened to meet a film director who the next week offered me a job as her assistant because she was going to be shooting a film. And I was like, sure. Yeah. Sure. I'll, I'll come and, yeah. And, you know, it was just like, I would just, I would have some things happening. And I, and it's funny because at that time, that was also when wasn't it, Peter Sellers was in charge of like the Olympics in, in, L- the, LA, a, the 84 Olympics? Yes. It was the 84 Olympics, and there was a huge arts festival that Peter Sellers was in charge of. The, Peter Sellers, the opera director, not the dead actor. Yeah. And I did a piece for that, and then went and like threw up everything and just well, learned about movie making. And did that for a while. I like learning curves, mm-hmm. right? Although at a certain point, the, like, the big movie industry stopped being interesting to me. I would have loved to be just an experimental theater director in my life. Probably would have been good at it had I been born with a trust fund. Yeah. But I wasn't. And I I really kind of hit limits to where I was going to be able to go completely on my own. And was kind of looking around and I said, you know, the, the mainstream movie industry is not my jam. It's really fun while you're figuring it out, but it was not my jam. And then I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was actually 
helping work on a really big action movie that was shooting in Italy at the time. And I was hiding in a very fancy hotel room reading 19th century German aesthetic theory and thinking about the nature of art. And I thought, okay, there was like this out of body moment. I thought, well, maybe it's time to admit that maybe it's time to go to grad school. Okay. Maybe it's time to go to grad school and read. And you did. You went to ger- grad school, studied German literature. I did. Which then led you to come here to Nashville yes. to teach at Vanderbilt. Uh-huh. Your life really, it really <laughs> took a turn and whatnot. Were you expecting this sort of turn or was it unexpected? Yeah. No, I mean, again, you know, academia was something I kind of knew, although it had, it, you know, it's constantly changing and now it's kind of ending in some ways. But I was in grad school for... You know, a number of years and taught on the East Coast you know, when I was in grad school. And then, yeah, I, I got this job at Vanderbilt in the German department. I'd never been in the South before. Mm. So that was kind of interesting. I'd gone from L.A. to Cambridge, Massachusetts and came from Cambridge here. Okay. And it was just, again, fascinating because it was very different, you know, kind of learning the South. And different communication patterns and the fact that it was, you know, in Boston, it would be really rude to talk to your exterminator because that person is supposed to be efficient, right, with Mm. her job. And here it would have been rude not to have a nice long conversation with Dara all about, like, the fact that I actually really like bugs and I would like to kill as few as possible. Mm. And we'd talk about our life experiences with bugs and then she'd do her job. Oh, yes. Right? (laughs) So... What, what what helped you navigate all of these 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 changes and stuff that were happening? I mean, because you're, you're here at Vandy, you're taking to the culture of the South, you're getting accustomed to your new job in academia. Well, and I came with a husband and one small child, a two-year-old at the time. I just, you know, I, I think that it's kind of how I am built. And, you know, maybe it's a factor of my very, very late kind of ADHD diagnosis, because no one got diagnosed when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I I am much more comfortable in the moment than I am kind of looking ahead. So I'm used to pivoting. I like being in the moment, you know, imagining possibility trees of the next moment or two. But I am always interested in possibilities and pivoting. So that's that's not a hard thing for me. Hard for me is if someone puts a limit on it or if someone says, stay in your lane. Mm -hmm. I can't stay in a lane. Mm -hmm. I don't don't understand lanes. And if someone says, where do you want to be in five years? I've never in my life been able to say that, except when I was like five and I said, I want to be, you know, Anna Pavlova and be the prima ballerina of the Bolshoi. Yeah, yeah. Well, (laughs) you've you've had, I want to talk about this. We're going to take a break quick, but you've had to pivot and someone also kind of told you to stay in your lane and limited to you when you left Vanderbilt. I want to talk yeah, about that yeah. in a minute after this break. Yep. Okay, we're taking one last break. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with the great Sarah Fiegel. As always, you can join the conversation by tweeting us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Khalil Colonna, and this is Nashville. Today we're speaking with Sarah Fiegel. She came to Nashville to teach at Vanderbilt and later stepped into the role of the executive director of the Nashville Conflict Resolution Center. She retired earlier this year. So grateful to have her with us. Thank you again, Sarah. All right. So we were when we left before the break, you had come to teach at Vanderbilt. Yep. Which was fabulous. Right. It's really fun. I mean, academia is a great gig, right? Because Mm -hmm. you get to teach bright undergraduates, curious people, right? Undergraduates and graduate students. And as a professor, I could choose topics. I could and think about things that excited me intellectually. And then the challenge is, how do I make every person who walked into my classroom leave saying, that's the most interesting thing I've ever heard? (laughs) How did you do that? 
by sharing, explain, helping them understand why it's the most interesting thing in the world, mm -hmm. right? Opening the questions, hearing like, and, and finding out from them what excited them and then inviting them to understand why they should also be excited by X, Y, Z. Teaching's fun. It's really fun. You enjoy teaching. Oh, yeah. But then you left Vanderbilt. And, well, okay. So I enjoyed, I enjoyed the teaching. I enjoyed the writing. I enjoyed, you know, and I, I had my accolades. And then uh, if you know about the academic system, if you are on a kind of tenure track, right, after about seven years, you, are, you come up for tenure, and then the university decides, are they going to keep you? And, and if, you, if you do, then you have basically a life, a career-long gig as long as you don't blow it. Mm -hmm. right? And in the years leading up to tenure, um, you know, you have to hit benchmarks. And you usually have a pretty good idea of, like, where you are and what's going on. And, and I was, you know... I mean, I was I was up for tenure. I mean, we would, I would talk to colleagues about what we will do once I have tenure, and then I didn't get tenure. Mm. I was denied tenure. And for someone not in academia, it may be hard to understand that, but it's kind of like, imagine you're on track for a lifelong career, and then the next day someone says, oh, by the way, you're out. You're out, yeah. It's just you're out. And you. it's not like you get to stay. That you get, you're told, oh, sorry, we're not giving you tenure. We'll give you one more year to kind of get your act together, and then you have to leave. How did that, how did that settle with you? Um, it was so confusing and humiliating. That was, that was the real, you know. Mm. Like, my husband was angry, right? Who, and my, my husband now is my second husband, and he was my husband at that time. Okay. By then, he was, we were married. And he was just, and he's also on the faculty at Vanderbilt. Okay. He was livid. And, you know, my mother, um, who was a professor and had been incredibly proud of me, I had to tell her. You know, I was the, I was the one who'd had the, the more meteoric, the fancier career path. I'd gone to fancier schools. I was, she was so proud of me. And then I had to say I didn't get tenure. And it was just, I think that was the most gut-wrenching thing. Mm. And, and I, uh, you know, it was like, I, I, you know, I would have these recurring dreams. It was really interesting. I'd have a dream that I was somewhere outside of the country and I was ready to travel home. And all of a sudden I didn't have any, I didn't have a passport. I didn't have paperwork to prove who I was. And no one would let me get home because they wouldn't believe who I was because I couldn't, I didn't have paperwork to prove it anymore, which uh, is a great metaphor. Uh -huh. right? Yeah. It was like, I know I'm me, but in the world I wasn't me anymore because the me that had lived in a social network was a very successful professor at Vanderbilt. Uh -huh. Right. And now I was humiliated failure. You know, what, <laughs> it was hard. I mean, it was hard. I can imagine how hard that is. But what, what that, what that could, what that, re how that resonates with me is that you know, so often people identify themselves through what we do for work and for right. money. Right. And it was, and in a way, I am really lucky that I had lived as I had because I've done enough different things. I know it's work, right? I know it's work. And I think, oddly, it really helped me. You know, my, my kids at that point, we had a blended family, and my kids were like maybe five, nine, and nine. You know, they're somewhere around those ages. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for the first week, I'm probably like just every now and then crumpling on the floor and crying and then saying, don't worry, sweetheart, I'm just, I'm having feelings, yeah. right? And then I had to teach them that, you know, I, I thought, okay, I will teach them and teach myself at the same time that really unexpected things can wipe out where you think you're going and what you think you're doing. But the important thing is we have each other and we have our curiosity and we have our talents and we just will figure something out. Mm. And today can be a beautiful day. Let's go walk at Radnor Lake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, Yeah. and just remember that life is much bigger than a career path. You mentioned your youngest is about to graduate college this yeah. coming school year. Yeah. 
Have your kids, as they're young adults now, have they talked to you about what they learned from watching you and being around you during those moments? I, uh, or do you see examples seen, of it in how they live? I, absolutely. And, you know, I, they're good communicators. And um, I think that they, they are aware of a lot of the ups and downs of my life. I mean, this was one big down, right? There were others. You know, there was a divorce that I didn't really plan for, right? Mm -hmm. There were years of being a single mother and trying to, there have been ups and downs. I've had really glorious extremes in both. (laughs) Yes. You know, really amazing, amazingly rich tapestry of life. (laughs) And I have shared all of those extremes with the kids to help them understand that, you know, it's like good luck, bad luck, who knows, right? It's always just going to keep flowing and flexing. Hmm. Who knows? Came to the NCRC. Hmm. Worked there for over... Again, it was just like serendipity, right? Because hmm. a friend said, why don't, you, why don't you train as a mediator? You're really good at that. It's like, okay, because I had no idea what I was going to do. Well, because since my husband was still at Vanderbilt, I couldn't just go and continue my career at a different university in a different state. Yeah. We had small children. Well, I could have and ripped apart a family. I wasn't going to do that. So I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to figure out something. I I went and started volunteering as a mediator, which was so eye-opening. Eye-opening in a way and humbling because, you know, I mean, I had done stuff in the arts and in academia and I traveled all over the world and I thought, boy, do I know the world. And it was like I went slap into a whole other multi-layered universe of real life that I hadn't really experienced. And it was very, very humbling Mm -hmm. and, and really meaningful. And then NCRC offered me a job. And so it was another open door. Yeah. It's like, okay. (laughs) And then, you know, a few years later, the, the artistic, the executive director at the time, um, had decided she was going to retire and the board asked me to take over. And, um, you know, I started out by saying no, because I didn't know about the nonprofit world. I, I, mm-hmm. I mean, I wouldn't have hired me. I would have been a great, I would, I knew I was a really good number two because I'm smart and I learn fast and I'm curious. Right. And I like solving problems, but I didn't know how to fundraise. I don't, I don't, I didn't have roots in Nashville. I didn't know how to go raise money at the salon ball. I, who am I, right? Yeah. I'm nobody. But, you know, the world being what it is, I guess the perfect person wasn't available at the time. So um, I ended up taking that job and then just loving <laughs> seeing how I could help grow this really important organization to be available to more people. You did grow it. I did. <laughs> and you've done it for a while. You retired. Do you miss working with the folks that you did at the NCRC? You know, I I so love them all. And I'm still volunteering, right? I'll go and mediate mm-hmm. and be I'm very proud to be a volunteer, but they are so great. I feel really happy just saying, "Okay, I was like the beta test and now that you get the like the legit <laughs> and they're just going to go and do astonishing things and I can just be like Proudly in the background saying, I knew them when. <laughs> <laughs> so you're still volunteering. So yeah. do, do are people still like tugging on your, your shoulder or your ear like, hey, you have this expertise. I'm in this particular situation. Are they still seeking you for mentor advice, I should say? Well, I'm happy to. I mean, that's that's no problem. I mean, that's we live in the world to ask each other questions and to be there for other people's, you know, mm-hmm. I, I'll talk to anybody about anything. But You know, I I am good at certain kinds of mediation that are tough. And so I have agreed to be on call. And if I do one a week or one every couple of weeks, I consider myself lucky to stay anchored in the world in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And now you decided to retire. And I understand you're you're putting your time and energies back into the arts. Yeah. Specifically weaving and playing the harp. Yeah. (laughs) What is it about those two things that involve lots of strings? Oh, yeah, it's all about <laughs> strings. Um, going back 
all out into the arts is something that's an, it comes as an incredible luxury because I couldn't have afforded to do it at any other time in my life. And now, yeah, you know, like I don't even have a bucket list anymore. Mm. I've, I've done so many things. Everything's gravy, right? I'm, not, I'm a very cheap date now. You know, I like good red wine. I need harp strings. I need yarn. Gotcha. Ah, you know. Yeah. Um, those two, they're really interesting and they both have evolved over time, right? But they like weaving, it can be very complex and intellectual in, in strategically thinking about creating patterns, you know, but it's also, I tend to weave also pretty intuitively with color and, mm -hmm. and I work in ways that can evolve as I'm working. And I think with weaving and with playing music, which also, I mean, I love music theory, I love jazz theory, it's very, it can be very intellectual, but then it's, in the moment, it is, it's pure expression and it is, it's free from language. It's out of my head. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it is, I am in my body, trusting my ears, trusting my eyes, and learning when the little thoughts come up like, oh, but is that the right thing? Or, oh, do you like that dynamic in music? Or, oh, what about that? Is that good enough? I, I'm, I've learned to just let those voices go. And it's just, it's like dancing. You know, mm. it's, it is just pure embodied exploration. You said something that really, it, it strikes a point, a chord with me. Okay, so living intuitively, living life intuitively, as opposed to being regimented or dogmatic with living life. That is something that's wonderful once someone has become a master. It's like, okay, you learn all the rules so you can live your life breaking the rules. Absolutely. Well, and so with music, for example, I have two harp teachers. One is classical, one's a jazz teacher. My classical harp teacher, um, Carol McClure, who's just an, the most extraordinary pedagogue I've ever encountered, is one of the very few humans I will obey, mm. right? Because I want the discipline because I understood way back from ballet that if you cannot do the smallest thing really well, the largest and most grandiose things are going to be just sloppy and useless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I'm enjoying taking time now to really learn slowly well, on the harp. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I can, I can improvise and explore, but I am enjoying learning slowly, and I don't ever have to play for anybody. I don't have to be good enough for anybody else. Mm -hmm. But I am learning a medi another medium, and it's just great. It's, it looks like it's great. You're smiling from ear to ear. <laughs> a lot of times we have people on, we're like, hey, what, what do you want to say to some young person out there as they're thinking about this and going through their life? I don't care about young people. What do you have to say to anyone who is kind of thinking about challenging themselves, taking a risk? changing up their lives is feeling the call of listening to their in in intuition and their desires, but they're a little bit afraid of answering that call. Um, I would start by saying all of the noise in our current cultural environment says, if you are drawn to something, monetize it. Mm. And I think that's the kiss of death for real creative exploration. <laughs> I, you know, I, there are some people who will be able to monetize, but I would say, first of all, allow yourself the incredible gift of having a hobby, of being really, really good at a hobby that you don't, and, and you're not, I mean, just to take advantage to explore it without needing it to be something that someone else either says is good enough or will pay you for or that it yeah that gets commercialized it just has to be a private joy thank you so much for being here i really enjoyed this conversation so much you're wonderful sarah fiegel has been involved with the ncrc for over 12 years including over eight years as the executive director she's le recently retired but still volunteers with the organization but you can find her weaving or gorgeously playing the harp. Again, Sarah, thank you so much. Thanks a lot.
And thanks to you for tuning in this hour. This is Nashville is a production of Nashville Public Radio. Today's episode was produced by Catherine Cece's. It was directed by Tasha A.F. Lemley. Our technical director and board operator is Liv Lombardi. The masterminds behind our theme musical, Orange and Namir Blade. You can listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get good podcasts. And the conversation does not end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. Find us on Instagram. Tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. You can also call and leave us a message at 615-751-2500. But note, any message you leave, we could potentially put on air. And this is Nashville. I'm Khalil Ekelona. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. And be good to each other.